before I get started, um, I have in front of me several quotes and okay. lots of notes. And I want everybody to know these come from Joel Goldsmith. They're not from me. So if it's from me, I'll let you know. But if it's a oh. direct quote from one of his books, um, I'll present it that way. He wrote about 30 some books. I did not reference all the books. You're welcome to read, um, but they're in there. So I just want that to be known. And then just by the way, Joel also studied uh, a lot of Eastern philosophy for many years. And then he had a student who became um, connected with him in, and she became um, his private secretary and she transcribed. So Joel would talk and, and give a presentation to a group and then she'd stay up all night and type. And so there's a lot of what are, quote, run-on sentences, which sometimes drives me nuts, but that's okay. But he had a lot of help doing this. So, yes, he did this beautiful message, and the primary book is The Infinite Way. So if there's one book out of all that Joel wrote, that would be the one that I'd start with. So if you're not familiar with Joel and you say, well, what's this about? Start with The Infinite Way. That was it's, also the first book, right? His main book. It's his, the it's first his, book was always the main book. Yes, it's his flagship book. And um, I think it was published in 1948. Right. And he, um, anyway, so if you want a kind of Reader's Digest version of Joel, start with that and then see where the spirit takes you. So you start off in all of Joel's work of reading something first and then as you learn to quiet your mind, you start to feel, you get a knowing, you feel a presence. It starts to become an experience. And the more you learn to relax into it, to quiet your mind, the more that experience flows through you and becomes your life. So that's Joel's message. So it starts off in text, you work with it, and it suddenly becomes an experience. It becomes, I think, to I know. I also have some more slides if you want to comment on them, Rod. Okay. Certainly. Here, here you go. You want to read it? I awaken in the morning with confidence, rejoicing in whatever work is given me to do. Whatever that work is, I do it, not in order to earn a living or in a sense of performing an onerous duty, but with joy and gladness. I let it unfold as the activity of God's expression through me. Sounds very much like Joel, right? That's very much like Joel. And the idea here, if I can quote from the Course, I am here only to be truly helpful. Another way of saying this, waking up in the morning is I turn, I surrender my thoughts to the divine and work with the divine all through the day, knowing that God walks with me. God is helping me to earn the living and God is helping me co-create and do all these chores that brings joy and gladness. I let it unfold, which means I've surrendered my will, my, my thoughts. In my experience, God says, today we're going to clean the toilets. And it's not my best job, but I do it with joy and it becomes a pleasant task. And I realize it's God's expression through me which is what Joel's experience is. I will step back and let him lead the way. The Course is saying the same thing. And so far, we've got, there's a resistance in us, though, to going all the way with that. If we can't, like, give 100% to God, if we gave 100%, then we'd be gone. Or at least so says the ego. And so that gets stuck into my craw, too. Which, so we continue to be living these kind of divided lives just can't quite make that final step. We can get closer maybe to God, but uh, who wants to just Jesus, become Jesus is what he's saying, <laughs> right? It, it's learning in all of Joel's writing, it's learning to surrender your will, learn to be quiet. Peace comes to a quiet mind. God can speak to a quiet mind. You learn to listen to that voice, trust it, like it says in the manual for teachers, trust. And then you relax. And Joel likes to quote the Bible quite a, book, quite a bit. And he'll say, rest, lie down in the green pastures, 
rest. Which is I might add that Rod, you've developed a, a daily meditative practice for quite a long time now. Correct. All right. And tell us how you do that. Do you do it daily? Do you? How long do you do it? Or uh... um, I do two things. Most days I start off reading Joel. Um, I read Silent Unity, Daily Word, and then I read the Course of Miracles lesson for the day, have half a cup of coffee. And then Jody and I like to go down and we meditate together. Oh. So I sit in a very comfortable chair. I can't sit on a cushion. I have an artificial knee, so that doesn't bend anymore. Mm -hmm. So I sit in a chair, get very comfortable. And after years of meditating, I can get quiet very quickly and I get centered my meditation is, Father, reveal thyself. Father, hold me. And I get quiet and just listen and wait for that feeling of fullness. It's a feeling of love and deep, deep peace. And I know I'm connected to the divine. I do that for half an hour. When I was younger, I would do it for two hours. Um, now, following that, all day long, I practice the presence, and Joel wrote that book, Practicing the Presence of God. In other words, um, I stay centered in peace. In one of the course lessons, it says, I choose peace instead of this. Joel says, you learn to have this meditation experience, and then all day long, you stay centered in divine peace. I don't know where this, John, if you'll mention it, but Joel says, this is a world of duality of good and evil, right and wrong. And our goal is to stay in the very presence of now. And in that presence, God's light, love comes through you and is expressed into your world. That is called in the Bible and with Joel, the added things, the things that I need. So like food, a house, the added things. I don't specifically ask those things, but I ask for the divine to reveal itself to me and help me to remember who I am. It's I am, God is. So in the morning, uh, I lay in bed for a few seconds and start to align my thoughts with the divine and then see where it takes me. But in general, I read, I do a formal meditation, and then all day long, it's constantly practicing the presence. And the other thing that I'd add is I like Lesson 109, in A Course in Miracles, I rest in God. So Jody and I will pray together at nighttime in, in bed. And that's our last, last thought is thinking of the divine. And Joel talks about that as well, of joy and gladness all day long when you're in the presence of now. That's God flowing through me, his beautiful light that the Course calls the great rays. And that lights up what's in front of me, and I can see clearly where to go. So that's my practice. Now, you use, also use this principle, though, as a doctor when you were working with patients. Can you explain something about how you would become intuitive when it became time to get some suggestions from a higher source as to how to handle a particular patient, for example? It, the... the the, the technique and method is always the same. It's just what I talked about earlier. Mm, so I've got a, a patient um, that's in cardiac arrest and going to die. And um, again, the first thought is panic and fear and the adrenaline kicks in. Everybody's running around. No matter what the appearance that your human eyes are showing you, Joel says what your human eyes are showing you is an illusion, a distraction, a form of hypnotism. What you have to do is learn to get really quiet. I've got four minutes to save this patient's life, but it was my habit after I've read and practiced that you have to create a pause for God to come in and talk to you. But if you're screaming, do this, do that, God, nobody can talk to you. So for just a few seconds, I just say, Father, what should I do? And then I get quiet. I learn to listen. And then very clearly in, in times of crisis, that voice is as audible as you and I talking right now. Do this medicine, do this medicine, do this medicine. And I do that. 
and suddenly the patient's alive. And there's times I've ordered tests. I've done very creative medicine, shall we say. <laughs> and the nurses look at me with like, I've got three eyes, but they don't realize I've got the, the Christ presence right here, helping me and guiding me. And then the patient survives and they say, how did you figure that out? So I have lots of stories, but the bottom line is, doesn't matter if it's a relationship, financial, a house, whatever the problem is, you have to learn to get quiet and release the divine that's within you. Joe likes to quote Robert Browning, release the imprisoned splendor within your heart. Uh -huh. Remove the prison bars that we put over ourselves. I'm unworthy. There's lack. I'm vulnerable. I have to get a job. Joel makes it a point. You don't look in the outside world, but you always turn within. God is within. Change your thinking. Allow the divine out. And the answers will always come. So I've never been let down. And many people are alive because of that practice. Mm. That's wonderful. Mm. I think it's interesting, too, that he didn't want to create a church. He didn't want to create a situation where people would be congregating and, I guess, gossiping and talking and <laughs> engaged in ritual. And that's sort of the really an exterior approach, a social approach. He's much more like a, a monk in that sense, really, really going deep into the connection. Yes, when he was he was studying Christian science early on, it was very open and there was really not much of a hierarchy to it. As that church progressed and he started to write The Infinite Way, um, a chasm developed and the church wanted more formality to it and formal lectures and formal hierarchy. And Joel realized that that was a trap to pull people out and to get approval through God. I was raised Catholic, and I always hoped God was in a good mood when I went to confession, because I know. <laughs> and uh, so we were taught that we're miserable sinners. And Joel says, no, that's not true. Look to the God that's within you. And that God says, you are a thought of love in my mind. It doesn't matter if you're evil or good those are human concepts when god looks at you he sees love and joel is saying learn to look at your fellow man with the eyes of love right. forgive the appearance forgive the illusion so yeah. having a church is going to add to the confusion sure. to the mass hypnotism and the illusion and add to the separation ultimately right. and he says no nope, turn within yeah, rather than going out, go in. Yeah, clear. Let's do a couple more quotes. This is a little fuzzy, perhaps. And I stuck a quote from Don, one of the Carlos Castaneda series down the bottom, believe it or not, because it reminded me of it. It says, you are the universe expressing itself as a human for a little while. I don't want to emphasize a little while. You know, like back in the 70s and 80s, I was into the Don Juan Carlos Castaneda series. It says, for me, the world is stupendous, awesome, mysterious, untenable. I want to convince you, you must learn to make every act count, since you're going to be here for only a short while. In fact, too short for witnessing all the marvels of it. It's only for a little while that we occupy this, this dimension. You want to add whatever you like to that? <laughs> oh, sure. Sometimes getting me to be quiet is difficult, but anyway... Joel wrote about this in a parenthesis in eternity. And what happens is we are eternal beings. We come along and suddenly we have a concept that we're separate from our eternal self, our divine self. That's the first part of, of open quotes, I call it. And that forms kind of a loop, if you will. That's our life, just like that universe you're looking at. And eventually you die. Well, the body dies, but you don't. You become, go back into spirit. You remember that I am a, div a divine being with life eternal. So he, he wrote specifically that it's a parenthesis in eternity, and that's our human life, a, a 
life of duality, separation. We need approval from the outside world. Some of us have a short journey and some of us a longer journey. But to God, there is no concept of time. But to us, there is. So Joel is saying, well, you're on this human experience and you are a divine being having this human experience. How about bring God into this? And instead of co-creating with this insanity or the ego, we learn to co-create with God. And a very, his primary message in the infinite way is, I and my father are one. Yeah. If you start to say that and let it become part of your thought system, yes, I'm having a human experience, but God is also helping me. It's very peaceful in a way too, isn't it? It's very peaceful. Yeah. It's um, knowing that the divine is going before you is like, it's like a, for me, it's a sphere of love. And I get into these situations and whatever comes at me gets filtered and clean by this white light, this white light of love. And I know I'm protected in everything. And there's nothing to fear. Just the other day, we were told this massive hurricane is going to hit Maine. And, you know, mm -hmm. up to 120 miles an hour. And I was very calm. And I would tell everybody, no, we're, we're going to be safe. It's not a big deal the hurricane blew right by us and went to nova scotia uh -oh. we had wind and a few leaves came down but that was it mm. but when you know that you're divinely protected that means the money the food the housing the weather everything falls under that uh protection of of god huh. so in meditation I go from one parenthesis or quotes rather to the other parentheses and I go back into I am an, an eternal being one with the divine and that is such a nice place to be then bring that back and let that flow into my life so you're always peaceful and whatever happens doesn't bother you it's really nice to be able to carry that peacefulness into the world with whoever you're working with, that helps to calm down any situation, I would think, right? Especially in an emergency room, <laughs> like where you used to work. The uh, nurses would, would just say, we love working with you. For, for whatever reason, this whole ER gets quiet. Mm. It's peaceful. And there's a code that comes in where somebody's dying. And what I'll say is everybody just calm down. And this beautiful peace, because I've opened my heart, flows into the whole room. Everybody's touched by it. And suddenly, I have a trauma patient, but we're talking this calmly. Mm -hmm. It's not like TV where everybody's running around. It's like, right. you need to do this. You need to do that. And what's really nice is the patient also feels that tremendous peace yeah. and says, if these guys aren't worried, why am I worried? Right. Peace overcomes the light, overcomes the darkness. And suddenly you have a good outcome. And we start cutting jokes and everything works out beautifully. Nice. Okay. It's just a nice way to live. Uh, you want to read this one? The very moment that any form becomes a necessity in, I, can't, I, I assume, our experience, we are placing our dependence, our happiness, and our joy in that instead of the infinite invisible which is the cause form and we are <laughs> idolaters. We, idolaters here we part of the slides cut off sorry about that oh well it's pro it probably caught off with uh, my it's okay it, people get the idea in essence if joel makes it very much a point happiness is within health is within and if there's upset in your life, it's because you're not thinking in alignment with the divine. You're out of alignment. So as the, the course, the, the world is a mirror. It reflects back to you what's going on. We're taught at a very early age, we have to get a job. We have to get married, get a house. We need things. And it can only be provided in the outside world. 
our happiness, our joy. And God says, that's not true. Excuse me, Joel says, that's not true. Turn to the God within. I believe it was Viktor Frankl who was eating a dead fish and he saw the beauty of it. Mm. He could eat it and survive the prison camps. Joel is saying the outside world is an illusion. It's a mass hypnosis. It's insane. And you cannot find happiness. It's always receding. So what can you count on? The outside world is change. But if you turn within and learn to look at everything with the visions of love and see the, the Christ consciousness in your brothers, in, in, in the world, Joel will make a point and say, God is a substance of all form. Learn to see in that fish, God. <laughs> I don't see with, with my human eyes. And I'm going to go off just on a tangent, but Joel says, all of your human senses are designed to deceive you. Whatever your eyes show you, whatever you hear in the outside world is not there. It's a form. It's an illusion, a mirage. Learn to see with the eyes of love to the divine. Learn to see through the form. In the Course in Miracles, they call that forgiveness. In unity, they call that let go and let God. Learn to look through that. Don't be an idolater. So I have a car. And when I was a young man, I loved that car. It defined me. It was everything to me. And I worshiped that car. I'd wax it every weekend. It became my idol. And if it's an idol, that means it controls you. So when the car got rear-ended, it destroyed me. I'm like, oh, how could that happen? Now, you know, 50 years later, it's like, I don't need a car. It gets hit. I don't care. What's important to me always is no matter what happens in the outside world, and I use this from a course, I choose peace instead of this. My son, Bradley, I put five bumpers on my car with Bradley driving. <laughs> and it just came back on the fourth bumper. It wasn't even 24 hours that we had the car and he drove into another sign and put a dent in the bumper. And I, he brings it back. And I said, can't you go more than 24 hours without putting a dent in the bumper <laughs> back to the shop? But in all these situations, by practicing the presence of God, allowing that to be with you, allow the idols to go. Joel will say, God is a jealous God. Stay with me. I and my father are one. Stop letting these idols control your life and define who you are. Stop looking to them for happiness. I and my father are one. My joy is complete in my heart. And then I just let it out. So Bradley smashes a car. I, I don't care. This house could burn down. I don't care. And not to scare anybody, but I could lay this body down. And I know where I'm going because I feel that love and presence within me. Mm -hmm. And that's what Joel is teaching. That's what the Course is teaching. Right. The Course is also teaching that this whole world is a mass hypnosis, as you were just saying. Correct. That we really, and that's the, what the Course calls the dreaming of the world. So we're, we're, we dream the world, we constantly dream the world. And I think there's something inside all of us at some level that kind of sense that that's true, but we can't verbalize it. We don't really know it. It's an illusion, but we can't really define this unless you, and then when you start doing something like really concretizing some piece of the world, like a car and making it really, really real to you, then you're the one that's making it real. Krishna Murthy once said that if you could take a, Ken Wapnick used this illustration as well, sort of Krishna Murthy though, you take a Coke bottle and you put it up on top of, say, an, like an altar thing, like a, above a fireplace or something, and you worship down in, fr in front of that Coke bottle every day and you bow in front of it, and, and et cetera, eventually you'll start thinking that that Coke bottle is a holy thing. <laughs> and of course, it's just a thing, right? So we, you know, we give it the energy. So 
a diamond, for example, right? My goodness. <laughs> it's got all this amazing value and it's a rock. <laughs> it's just a rock. You know, I'll, I'll tell you, John, the difference between graphite and a diamond, they're identical except for one thing. A diamond has one extra electron. Wow. That's it. And we pay a lot of money for that diamond. I tried to use graphite, but it didn't fly as a, as a wedding ring. No, I bet not. <laughs> the other thing, um, Joel wrote about walking between two worlds. Mm. And we're all right now walking between two worlds. And I like to say one foot is in spirituality, divinity, where it's oneness, where God and I are one. And then the other foot is in the human world of duality, fear, darkness. God is light. This world is darkness. It's insane. And what Joel is saying is turn to the light. Don't turn to the darkness. That's where the depression and the upset and all the problems come. But turn more to the light and let more of that light into this darkened light area that we're living in. Right. So it's another book. He's, he's touched on a lot of subjects. Oh, got a few more quotes from Joel Goldsmith here. Uh, well, that's so very, very brief, but that's just kind of a summarization of what you were just saying, right? Correct. Yeah. And that um, Practicing the Presence is a book that he wrote specifically about this, where he said, God has to be our blood, our air, our body, and we have to let the ego die every bit, every day, a little bit more each day, we bring more life. And that God activity then becomes our consciousness. So we learn to look through the illusions. Tell you about a kind of a funny experience. I also lay in bed in the morning and meditate. And one morning I had uh, an extra load of things I had to do in the course of the day. And I was wondering how I was going to get through them all. And so I just put out to the universe, God help me. And I heard, help me. <laughs> <laughs> back at you <laughs> that couldn't have been more clear could it <laughs> all right couple more but god, is this, go god, ahead i was just gonna say god i like to tell people with every heartbeat that's god not yeah. the door of your consciousness and you have to learn to open that door to let him in Here's a quote from A Course in Miracles, which I thought was some, similar to what Joel was saying as well about the body in particular. The ego, which is not real, attempts to persuade the mind, which is real, that the mind is the ego's learning device, and further that the body is more real than the mind is. No one in his right mind would possibly believe this, and no one in his right mind does believe it. So, I'm on the rule of the body. In Joel's position. All right. Um, Joel has several, th and these are from Joel. Um, it's it's just I just titled it "Man," but um, basically, it's the belief in a self. And that's a small s, s e l f, small self, which is small, limited, from cradle to grave. Um, we are separate and alone. It's mental causes producing effects. A universal belief in a selfhood apart from God. And um, he also says, we are the fallen branch from the tree of life. Um, so we need to learn um, that the body is not our true self. Mm. It's, again, another uh, illusion. Now, he doesn't, he doesn't talk specifically like the, the, the same language as the Course, but nevertheless, it's he talks about healing quite a bit. And he said, when somebody comes to you with, with whatever the problem is, I personally don't care. I don't hear the drama. I don't want to hear the story. Mm. I want to know what the problem is because it's an illusion. Mm. And this illusion's cancer. This illusion's a broken leg. It doesn't matter. Joel says, get quiet and realize, bring the presence of God into this help the person that is hurting to remember their divine presence 
that they are not body, they are not this illness, and let love, awaken love, help them to remember who they truly are. That love then goes into their life, and that's where the healing takes place. Right. So, and the other thing that he says, the five senses testify to the limitation of our human humanhood. Um, the body is not self acting it is governed uh, by spiritual power once you've learned to let god in and again like our earlier slide i'm not separate from the divine we are one and we're walking in light eventually as, as as joel goes on the more light you let in your body suddenly he calls it the temple of god it becomes so holy and then you have these mystical uh, instances if you will holy instances is what the course calls it where you are divine and you remember i and my father are one i am that's my true self and you have these episodes they're not all the time they're spontaneous and you practice meditation and um you work with it and then every once in a while you, when everything's right you get this mystical moment so he's very clear um the body is is not who you really are it's amazing we're so caught in the world and in the body and in the external that that we can't see it and that's why meditation is so important to enable us to see it but whatever we do to get quiet time with that i got some more quotes here this is from joel can you see that all right yeah. want to read it yep release from fear Worry and doubt leaves us free to function normally, healthfully, and confidently. So going back to what I was saying, we walk in two worlds. One is in confidence, love, and peace. It's, it's, it's the side of love. It's now, and we are one with the divine. As we step into the human world, where it's crazy, insane, or hell, whatever you want to call it, we get entrapped with fear and worry and doubt. How am I going to pay the bills? Oh, I've got cancer. And that darkness pulls you farther and farther and farther into more darkness. Now I've got to see doctors. They add their fears and worries. You get on the internet and go, oh, that's it. I've got two years to live. And Joel is saying, stop. Stop that whole process turn like the prodigal son stand up turn to the light and walk home to god that's what right. he's saying as you do that you start to let go of the fear and worry and doubt and trust that the divine is going to take care of you suddenly as forgiveness is forgiveness is the key to salvation and then salvation leads to joy so this is the same thing, release, forgive, worry and doubt. That leaves us to function normally. I get to choose light or darkness. And the more I choose light, I gain health. And that's health in all areas of my life. The farther I go on that path, I learn trust. So I start off with my faith, like my little bit of faith. And the more I walk and the light gets brighter, the more I connect to the divine, my confidence grow until finally you come to the place of, I know there is no more doubt. And the world's on fire. And it's like, I see through that the illusion. And I see that the divine is beyond that. That's the forgiveness seen through the illusion. And that's where I'm going. I think it's interesting. Uh, we're currently studying the 50 Miracles Principles in the ongoing class. And the, we'll be on number four this week. It says miracles are natural when they don't occur, something has gone wrong. So we've kind of got everything kind of backwards, but the natural part we're not even seeing. And yet it's there in everybody to be seen. <laughs> How simple it is. Right? That's Jesus saying, I am the Father of one again. It is. Do that. But if I can, from a medical point of view, our body 
At one time, we were all part of the food chain. Mr. Sabretooth would come along, and my body's designed to kick in the adrenaline and to run. That's a built-in defense. But the concept of sitting down and meditating and to be peaceful is wow. is a learned uh, part of our... We have to learn that. It's, it's in the front part of our brain. But that's not natural to our bodies. Our bodies are always attack and defense. So we have to learn peace. Right. So when Mr. Sabretooth comes, you don't sit down and meditate. <laughs> right. Normally you get up and run, at least I yeah, would. Right, normally. <laughs> Let me do a couple more slides, then we'll break and have uh, people begin to come ask you questions, Rod. Okay. So you govern your surroundings, or you, uh, you govern your surroundings by the nature of what taking place in your consciousness pretty much what you were just saying the lesson on saturday was you are responsible for all of your thoughts and you are responsible for what's occurring in your life your thoughts are governing your surroundings and and that's that is whatever your thoughts are are expressed in your life so whatever you're thinking about in your consciousness I'm unworthy, there's lack, I'm vulnerable. Those are the three uh, primary ego uh, concepts. And any of those says, so, so then what happens is I feel lack. Then I don't have enough money to pay the bills. There's not enough food. So your surroundings are nothing but a reflection of what's going on in your mind. And Joel says, you're responsible and I think it's it's your favorite quote. What is it? Chapter 21. I am responsible yeah. for, for everything. And Joel yeah. says the same thing. It's just that he uses a slightly different language. Mm -hmm. right. At the same time, that's true. It's also we're responsible for our the, all the projections we throw out into the world there with this ego of complaining and fault finding. And God Almighty, that gets us into a lot of trouble. If that's what we're seeing, we are what we see, right? <laughs> right. It's like you are what you eat, or you are what you see. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have to have a filter. And remember, and Joel says this, your senses are all designed to deceive you. Yes. And so let me ask you, why, why do we have two eyes? And, and you say, well, they're separated by one and a half degrees. And the reason you have two eyes that reinforces depth perception. Mm -hmm. I can see I can see the back, I can see the front, say, oh, they're not the same. That's separation. If you mm -hmm. close it and make just like one eye, everything's flat and I can't distinguish. So your senses are constantly lying to you. And it takes practice to say, okay, I got to look past that. We don't know that on the on the surface of the things we don't know that. That's why things like Joel and the Course are, are so helpful, is to help us to understand why we see what we think we see. Right? Yes. Well, there's two more, two more. Here's another slide. Okay. You want to read it? Let us have no addresses to which God's grace is to be sent, because God is not interested in one one person more than another. Yeah. So God, if you want, think of it, um, God is like gravity. God doesn't care if you're rich or poor, um, what race you are, if you're evil or good. So a specific address, God does not understand. God says, when I look at you, I see love. I see myself. When I look at you, I say, oh, you're in New York. And but I think you're in California. See, we look at specifics, but God says, I look at all of you. I don't see where you live, but I do see me in you and you in me. We are one. So he's not interested in one person. Going back to gravity, you don't see gravity loving some people more than another. You don't see people who are bad floating off the earth, do you? <laughs> see people who are good getting slammed into the earth because gravity really loves them we're all treated the same and that's god he's impersonal 
you are a thought of love in the mind of God. Just think about that. And that being said, you are still one with each other and you're still one with God. So eventually, here's another analogy. You have a bucket of ice uh, water and all these ice cubes think they're separate. They've all got different addresses, different bodies. Well, eventually in time, as the warm gets warm, as the room gets warm, the ice melts. You're all still there, but where are you? The ice cubes are gone. You've returned to your divine source. That's what God says. God says, I am the water. All right. That's a great analogy. Thank you. Yeah. One or two more here. I think did did you talk about this one already? Um, um, we don't use God as a power. We don't pray to God to destroy our enemies. Yeah, let's see. No, I can't read it at all. We but basically Joel is saying, I don't pray to God to win the football game, or I don't pay for money. I don't pray for anything specific. The prayer is always, Father, reveal thyself. God does not understand specifics. God has one word, and that word is love. In the human world, we have millions of words. God says we are all one. In the human world, we're all taught to go outside of ourselves and pray in church. And I was taught, you know, you want to get good grades, pray for good grades. And if you're really good, God's going to reward you. Hmm. And Paul says, that's not true. That external God is not true. The divine is within you. The divine knows what you need before you know. So the, the, the real, the, the primitive prayer is, God, heal me of this cancer. Please help me get a job. God, help me in this relationship. And Joel says, no, pray to God to reveal itself and reveal that love and then let it flow in, into your life. So in the lower one, it says power, fame, money, physical pleasure. Who is the hero to whom all these things belong? They could not mean anything except to a body, yet a body cannot something Evaluate. Evaluate. By seeking after such thing, the mind associates itself with the body. Right. Obscuring its identity and losing sight of what really is important, I think. What is real? What is real? What really is. So here we're talking about the reality, capital R. The reality of, of your you is you are a divine spirit, still one with God. And you're being distracted again by power, fame, and money and physical pleasure. Those things all change. It's one day they're really good. My car is beautiful. I love it. The next day, the transmission's dead. I can't pay for it. And it's the body that gets upset. And it's our mind that gets upset. Because again, we're walking in the darkness looking for the light. And we have to say, turn and look look to the to the light to find true happiness everything in the physical world is an illusion it's a dream a mass hypnosis or or joe calls it a mirage right you know and you're in the desert driving along and you see the the, the lines coming up and you, you think you see things and you drive the 10 miles and you get there it's still more desert it's a mirage and to say oh i just want to get to that mirage then I'll be happy. The ego is always saying, seek, but do not find. Right. Keep looking. So we've been going for almost an hour. I'm going to spend some time dialoguing with the folks who are with us. Uh, Bud, do you see anything going on in the chat, or uh, shall we just uh, open the floor for conversation? There really isn't any qu um, questions in chat right now. It's just been a lot of comments of, of um, agreement with everything that's yeah. been going on. I was thinking that it would be hard to disagree <laughs> with anything, but still folks must be, I'm going to stop sharing for a little bit and John.
go into uh, gallery view and see if we can't get a little bit of dialogue going on about different folks take on the amazing similarity actually between Joel Goldsmith and the Course in Miracles. They really are saying the same thing, except it was uh, uh, by a, quite a number of years. Here we go. We got a couple already. Jim, you want to start us off and then Leslie? Sure. Thanks, John. <clears throat> um, and thanks, Doctor. I'm sorry, I forgot your name. Oh, sure. Yes. God, God, God's fine. Doctor. Right. Okay. Fine. Thank I'm you. Uh, you. You started off, said some important things about getting quiet and uh, need to do that in meditation. Um, can you say some more about the process of getting quiet and what process in meditation helps us to do that? I see so much benefit from it, but I couldn't put my finger on how, you know, that has happened. It seems to happen, but I'd like to be more conscious of that process, if you can share that. Um, it's, it's mostly practice. When I was starting out the night before, the night before I would, as I was going to sleep, I would say, I'm going to have a good meditation tomorrow. So I start to program. I find that um, our body holds a lot of stress. And so exercise and eating well and cutting out caffeine, cutting down and cutting out alcohol, all these things that distract me. What's really important is I have to get my mind ready. I, I need to read about 45 minutes spiritual literature. And it's it it it's like a, a preamble to meditation. I like a cup of coffee. It's like my coffee, that's the way it is. Um, my body says I want something. Anyway, for me, then I've had no formal training. Um, I do know that I have to sit in a comfortable chair. I sit with a pillow um, behind my back right here. If my, my back is slouched, um, I don't have a good meditation. Sometimes I stretch. I do a lot of stretching if I'm tight and anxious for whatever reason to, to kind of burn that off. Then I sit in the chair. I get really, really cold. Um, I get so deep that my heart slows down and sometimes I forget to breathe. That means my metabolism is slowing down. So I put a blanket on. If it's really bright, I put sleep shades over my eyes. And if the neighbor's dogs are barking, that they've got five wild dogs that bark, 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 I put headphones on. And that becomes my cave. So now I'm comfortable and warm. And then I deliberately slow my breathing down. Just less and less calm my breathing. And that helps me to stay centered in what I do. Very important. Um, so you breathe in and breathe out. There's a bit of a pause at the bottom of that cycle where the lungs have to reset. It's about four tenths of a second. So that's normal. And then all the monkey chatter that's going on upstairs, I learned to let that go. And my mantra is peace. It's always just peace, peace. And with practice, you start to dissociate from the, the chatter. The chatter is always going to be there, no matter how quiet you get, because your brain is always active. So imagine if instead of your brain, you told your heart to be quiet, make <laughs> noise. Now you're going to have a problem. The unconscious mind, the back of your brain here, is always regulating blood pressure, heartbeat, breathing. The way your brain stays healthy is to generate a thought. Your job is to look at it like a shooting star and not react to it. Go, oh, and if it drifts me off course, I just go peace. It brings me right back to center. Just like in life, oh, there's a car crash, peace. Oh, I just won the lottery. Peace. Oh, there's a war in Russia. Peace. I choose peace instead of this. Peace is my mantra. A lot of my friends I've given peace plaques to. It's the most important word, word to me in all of human language. So it's practice. But 
simple things like put lampshades on, put your, you know, get quiet, get comfortable, stretch, make it your intention that I'm going to have a good meditation. And then finally realize I like to lift weights and there's days I'm really strong and I'd like, wow, good workout. And other days it's like, wow, this is heavy. <laughs> I don't know, but you're going to have good meditations and not so good meditations. God doesn't care. God <laughs> keeping track of, you know, I've heard people say you have to meditate half an hour, twice a day, every day. Otherwise it won't work. And I go, so God's up there with a check. check. <laughs> so you relax and say, I don't have to learn all this different styles. I'm going to play with it. And finally, Father, reveal yourself. Teach me. Let go and have no expectations and just sit. Thank you very much. Very much appreciate it, Dr. Ryan. You're welcome. You're welcome. I see that we've got a couple of doctors with us uh, besides Rod here. How about Dr. Leslie? Why not come on? Or I guess good afternoon where you are. Hello. Rod, good to see you. Um, I think it just seems to me with the whole process that in times of crisis or even not in times of crisis, For me personally, the willingness is, am I just willing to listen? Mm -hmm. If something comes up, if that sense of discomfort comes up, can I just stop and just listen? I had an experience almost 40 years ago where I remember going into a room and somebody was very sick and I just froze. And it was a, it was very, uh, it was a very uncomfortable experience. And then afterwards, when I just had a little time to reflect on it, what I realized was just learn the process that will allow me to just slow down and just to listen and then work forward. I mean, I think sometimes for myself what i found is that the process of learning is not the stuffing in as much information as you possibly can but it's more a case of finding a method that works for myself and for each one of us where we can just slow slow the pace of things down enough that we're just willing to listen and i think along with that goes the humility and the willingness to listen and to change course even in periods where you know you're in a con uh, I'm in a conversation and I can feel the tension mounting just to quietly stop and it doesn't have to be for very long it can simply be for a second or two or two seconds whatever the case may be but I what I found personally is that the willingness to stop to slow down and be humble enough to listen and I won't say anything else Thanks. Great talk, guys. Thanks, Leslie. That, that's very important. You can also think of it as a mini meditation where I surrender my will. I want to hear what God has to say. And in some of these crisis situations, it's I surrender my will. I open my mind. Father, what do you have to say? I invite the divine in. Not my will, but your will. And trusting, that gets scary when someone doesn't have a heartbeat for 30 seconds. You know, it gets kind of tense. And you have to say, okay, I made a commitment. I'm going to do this. And boom, there's the heartbeat. So it's, it's learning. Leslie, the other thing I was going to just share with you it's not always crisis situations. The other day I lost my cell phone and I thought, I, I have a big house. I'm not going to run all over the place. So I got quiet and I said, father, where's my cell phone? <laughs> and he said, it's upstairs in your pant pocket. 
three times yesterday I had to ask for help. Where's my cell phone? Because I was all over the house doing stuff. But you learn to get so comfortable with that. The humility, learning to, I got a quiet mind, stop that monkey chatter in your mind and learn to listen. That means I'm going to get quiet. So think, I'm going to have a little mini meditation and just listen. And it's practice. And it gets faster and easier. Mm. I've also learned to take it from the crisis situation and apply it to everything in my life, especially like you when I uh, occasionally, well, actually more than occasionally lose stuff. And I just say, okay, I don't know where it is. Uh -huh. Let's just listen. Thanks. So you're not going into the fear and the darkness that Joel talks about. You're turning, you're, you're not going to the outside world and, you know, calling 911. You're learning to, to go within and remember that I and my father are one and my cell phone is actually part of God and say, oh, what does the God have to say? I'm going to listen. I'm going to ask. And in all parts of my life now, it's like I always choose peace and give peace a chance. It will answer you. You know, I think, Dove, Dove, you on, you, you're willing to come on and talk about your experience and trusting in your condition or not now, a little bit later? I'll let it, I'll let it, I'll come on later. But Jane, you want to share? Thank you. Um, yeah, my first question was, I have such hard time with stillness and you've already spoken about that very nicely. Um, I also have such a hard time with accepting that here as seemingly a body, there are two voices within me. And I feel that I deeply want to listen to spirit and be the love that I truly am. but I have such a hard time simply accepting ego and not hating it and condemning it. And I find myself constantly judging myself in such a harsh way that once again, I've turned to ego and listened. Um, so to get still and to find acceptance of this duality that I seem to believe in right now is really throwing me into fear and panic. Yeah. Well, first of all, you should all know that I self-diagnosed myself as having divine schizophrenia. <laughs> <laughs> I'm to get to the DSM. <laughs> <laughs> but I hear the voice of God, and I feel that presence, and sometimes I see it. I see the divine. So that's, you're growing, which is great. So it's, oh, yeah. you hear things and see things, and your friends are like, yeah, there's something wrong with you. There's not. You're you're growing in, into the divine. So there's that. The, the second is, you have a belief that you're unworthy, and you do something wrong and you yeah. come down on yourself with such attack. And what I do is I turn to that and say, you have no power over me. I think of this, Jane, you are a thought of love in the mind of God. As Joel would say, you are individualized Christ consciousness. Does it get any better than that? And your divine real parent is God or Mother Mary, whatever you want to call it, Buddha, whatever. Stop looking at it from the human perspective and look at yourself from God's perspective. God looks at you, says, I see love. Now, I like my ego. He helps me drive the car, balance the checkbook, and get food, whatnot. But when he's starting to say, mm, there's lack or you're unworthy, you're not good enough, I immediately come back with, you have no power over me. 
And you think about Christ saying that to Pontius Pilate, he's dying. He's gonna, and he says, don't care. Mm. In the ER, I would have doctors mad at me and throw books at me or administrators <laughs> screaming at me or lawyers. And my stance, and I'm going to give this to you, is I would disconnect and think you're flaming insane. And I would smile and wave. Cute uh -huh. <laughs> I wouldn't do that, but but you see, you're laughing, and the ego has no defense against laughter. Smile and wave at that thought. You have no more power. God is my uh, defense. Yeah. I like that image. Yes, wow. yeah. Think it's changing, like Joel says, change your thinking from outside to inside. It's that simple. And you go, you have no more power over me. You know, I'll, I'll say to my ego when he's really doing things, I say, are you having a bad day? Or I'll say, is this the best you can do? My house is on fire. And I'll go, okay, is that the best you can do? <laughs> you see, and we want to engage with, oh, my God, the house is on fire. But so what? It's kind of fun to rebuild the house. And God always has a better plan for you. You learn to trust. So who's your real parent? God. Who are you really? You are the divine. Co-creating as a Jane. And that Jane is going to grow into and change last name from Northfield to Christ. Jane Christ is going to be your new name. And you're going to feel the holiness and the splendor and the glory. That's the what Joel was talking about. That divine consciousness is really who you are. If you will, your beautiful consciousness, you put a it's your light, you put a lampshade over it, and you think you're the lampshade. And I'm saying take the lampshade off and look at that beautiful light. Put it down. That's an that's an ego thought. It's not a real thought. It's not a thought of God, which is you are love, you are me, I am, we are one. Yeah. It's just, it's so simple that you have no power over me. And let it go. There's a workbook lesson I like a lot. Uh, let all things be exactly as they are. Just let all things be exactly as they are. And just leave it alone. It's okay. It's not Nothing to go crazy about. Um, yeah, it may yeah. Like just so true. And yeah. then... I tell myself, yeah, but you you just can't do it. Oh. <laughs> so that, that, yeah, that's So you get the one-two punch of the ego. You get the yeah. second punch. And then you're going, you're really, then you get the second one. You're not, you can't do it. You're not strong enough. The only power, as Joel will say, in this universe is God. Right. And you have the power of God within you to create, to co-create. So start co-creating with God and, and the ego is going to go down and God's going to go up, die a little ego death every day, as Joel will say. Yeah. And that means smile and wave, cute and cuddly. You know, you're a horrible person. You didn't pay your taxes. You didn't give money to this homeless person. Okay. God's going to take care of all that. And you're going to say, I'm going to let love come through me. And be like the the, the, yeah. the child holding the hand of God and God's walking with you. And says, God says to you, you're my holy child in who I'm well pleased. I love you because I created you in my mind, in my image, and I gave you the fullness of heaven. Everything I have, you have. So <laughs> who's limiting you? Like, oh, I yeah. can change my mind from darkness to light. It's just my ideas. It, it's just an idea. There just, you go. And yeah. yeah. No, I want to walk the path of God. Yeah. That's every morning. Yeah. Show me the way. Exactly. Thank you. Thank of course, you. Of course, we'll say you were taught poorly. You got to unlearn <laughs> this world. Right. It's insane. Right. So step out of the insanity into the light. It's really about learning how to be a co-creator, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And God loves Corvettes and he loves woodworking 
And God loves building houses. He loves relationships. The damnedest thing. He loves everything I love. It's just... <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. So, thank you. Thank you. Think of it that way. Let's go to Lynn Johnson. Lynn, go on. There we go. Hey, good morning, everybody. And uh, hi, John. Hi. Uh, welcome, Rod. It's so good to see you. Um, so, yeah, I actually first heard about, uh, I mean, I had heard about Joel Goldsmith, but not really about Joel Goldsmith for, uh, you know, I didn't really look at him, uh, but uh, from uh, Vicki Poppy and her sister Noreen and brother-in-law Harvey. <clears throat> and, you know, I, I didn't realize that um, Joel was contemporary, that he lived when I was alive <laughs> and uh -huh. was here in this world um, uh, doing this amazing teaching. But I started listening. Uh, I didn't really read uh, that much because I'm visually impaired. Uh, so reading is really difficult for me. But I started listening to Joel and listening to recordings of Joel and um, um, oh my gosh, hours upon hours upon hours <laughs> of that voice, that good morning, you know, the way, <laughs> the way he speaks and the way he says words like consciousness. And, you know, I can't obviously sound like that, but, um, but I, as I listened and, and realized it was almost like I was hearing the same words that I heard in A Course in Miracles. I mean, it's the same exact teaching as A Course in Miracles uh, with maybe a little bit of a different emphasis because A Course in Miracles, a uh, big part of the emphasis is on joining with your brother and and uh, doing things with, you know, <laughs> with, with, you know, with your brothers. But, um, but, you know, Joel kind of, correct me if I'm wrong, but it seemed like it was much more of an individual um, uh thing not so much of a big group thing kind of thing but um but the thing that really fascinated me about joel uh many things but the was that he was a healer and right. um and and that he could heal you know people at a distance people that he didn't see people that he didn't even know he might have just read a note about them or just heard heard something and he could connect with them and shift apparently it has to have been a shift in their consciousness um because uh people would actually be healed from some serious illnesses and some severe situations um and so i was really fascinated with that how did he do that and you know going through the course of miracles and looking at how does healing how does healing occur and you know i recognized that the actual healing comes from the uh the recognition of our connection with our source by actually recognizing our connection with our father our source um that actually brings about healing because we are no longer um caught in the the um the world of form but actually acting and reacting from spirit um and um, uh, the other thing that I really came to understand and, you know, I see this so much now, um, uh, is that God is in everything and everything is God. And right. so these sick people that you think you're seeing, that's God and, and that's God and, and, or, you know, everything, my computer is God, uh, yeah. God is God, every, everything is God because what else could it be? And if God is everything and everything is God, then love is everything and everything is love. And so the love that I experience <laughs> for you is, is my, our connection with, with, with Holy Spirit and with God. And <clears throat> so I know you're talking a lot about the stillness, which is very important. Meditation, which is very important. Uh, centering yourself so that you can be in that state without mm -hmm. panicking or being afraid and so um 
so much of what you've been saying so far and uh, uh, everything that, you know, we has been shared has been so helpful to me already today. Um, and I just wanted to con connect with you on that and to let folks know, uh, I'm going to throw in a pitch here, that we are doing a Joel Goldsmith Living the Infinite Way group on ACIM Gather, which is our uh, radio uh, program, mm -hmm. uh, chat room and radio program that we have um, every Friday uh, at 1130 Eastern time. So uh, if anyone were wanting to join that group, uh, they could contact me and I'll put my email address in here. I know it was in Miracles Magazine. I was going to tell you, uh, you missed the M. <laughs> but I'll put my email address in the uh, in the uh, chat. And if anybody wants to join in that group, uh, it's online. It is a Zoom class, but it is a private class. We don't put it on YouTube. And uh, people are welcome to come and share Living the Infinite Way with us. So thank you for letting me share. And uh, blessings, blessings, blessings. And okay. tell your beautiful wife, Jody. I said hello. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And I'll meet myself and, and uh, let, let the other Lynn, our Brooklyn, <laughs> Come on. Before we're doing that, uh, Gloria, you're facilitating in that too, are you? You want to just. Yes, I am. Yes, I am. And uh, that's beautiful. Thanks for sharing that, Lynn. Um, yeah, we basically, on the fourth Tuesday, we are having a reading of Elizabeth Parker's book, which is an introduction to Joel. We do that on YouTube, so there's no discussion. It's afterwards when we close the meeting. And on Fridays, we started with Living the Infinite Way. And uh, it's a joining. We do discuss it and share how it's it's really more of a comparison of the two teachings and not a contrast of mm -hmm. them. So we're bringing together what ACIM and the Infinite Way both share in common, which to me is everything, as I studied both for 30 years and both of them on my life. So uh, mm -hmm. that, and I really love what Lynn said. And the idea is what we recognize is it's we move into our consciousness. Once we recognize the presence and we're in that state of the presence, our projection ceases to be. The ego pro projection stops. So all there is then is the love of God. And like, oh, Rod, I, you did an excellent job today and so beautiful. And thank you so much for this. It's thank absolutely you. wonderful. Thank and I appreciate everything you said. And I agree with everything you said 100%. Thank you. Okay. Well, I've got Joel right here. And he says thank you, too. So <laughs> that's the truth, by the way. He's he's one of my spiritual guides. So going back to Lynn, just for a second, Joel in his writing says, God is the substance of all form. So no matter what you look at, you say, I see those books behind John Mundy. If I look deep into that, and say, but that's God. Everything is God. Joel was was uh, first started teaching quite a bit. And then people would come to him and say, will you heal me? So Joel's thought was, again, I mentioned this, I don't care what the illness is. My job is to hold the light. And the light is I and my father are one. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to hold that light for you until you get to see it. And our consciousness accepts that once that light and you you've accepted it flows into your life any form of darkness is healed it has to be because you're now changing your consciousness from darkness to light so the appearance in the world changes that's how it works Jeez. he was very good at it <laughs> he was very good at it and the people that that um he had a very high success rate. It was like the woman who, who touched the hem of Christ and said, if I could just touch his hem, mm. I'm going to be healed. So Joel's teaching to groups of people that already, you know, say, I get a feeling about him. I already open it. If I can just touch him, I'm going to be healed. You see, so they're primed and ready to go. And they're healed. Hmm. If if I can share some personal stories, um, I had three cancers. I had colon cancer, testicular, and kidney cancer. All of those are lethal. And I made the decision when the doctors told me, you know, got some bad news for you. 
you've got cancer, my first thought was, this is not real. This is mm -hmm. not the truth. My next thought was, I and my father are one. I am divine love. This can't hurt me. And so, yes, I had surgery. That's called being normal, common sense. You got cancer, get rid of it. But then God said, you don't need any further testing. You don't need chemo. You don't need radiation. That was in 2014. My intention is, and my belief is that I am divinely protected. And the ego is always throwing things at me. <clears throat> I don't care how I got the cancer. All things are lessons God would have me learn. I learn this is not real, and I'm going to forgive this. And I'm going to let divine light come in and take care of it and go, it ain't my problem. <laughs> God's going to take care of it. Yeah. Lynn and Stephen. Lynn? Wow. Namaste, my beautiful, 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 mighty companions. Um, <laughs> thank you so much for your love. Oh, my God. But anyway, um, I have a poem that Lynn Johnson loves it. So that's, you know, I like to read. And John, you heard it. Gloria, you heard it a lot. Uh, it is all God, no matter what. Any appearance, form or not. Pain so deep opens to joy as all is known as God and drag. <laughs> Thanks, Lynn. <laughs> Appreciate it, honey. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I, I do have a question. Um, listening to what you just said about cancer and stuff, um, you know, I'm listening to you now, and I'm actually quite relaxed, and uh, I say, this sounds really good, and I could believe in God and all that, but if I was to suddenly have some medical symptom let's say my first thought would be 911 er get an x-ray mri whatever the doctor says and then maybe somewhere in the recesses of my mind i would say well what about god no well i'll wait with god let let, let these people work their magic first and it seems to me the wrong way <laughs> i should first maybe be looking at god but i wasn't brought up with that and maybe you can give me some insight how I could put God first and then maybe 911 or the ER and whatever. Second. Yeah, Thank well, you. first of all, what is the medical problem? So I had a friend that was having a transcendental meditation and uh, everything's fine. He's changing a light bulb, standing on the kitchen table, which is not a good idea. He fell and he crushed his whole right yeah, his left his left ribs he crushed, and it's called a flail chest. And now he's not breathing. Transcendental meditation isn't going to help. He needs a chest tube. So pop that in, reinflate his lungs, and pull his ribs back out. So what is the problem? And how much time do you have with, with a flail chest? You've got maybe half an hour. You can meditate all you want. I can tell you. <laughs> unless you're really, really good and can bend all that stuff, you need medical help. So my, that's my point. But if you've got something like cancer that's been there a while and you have the chance to think about it, the minute the doctor says, okay, uh, that cough that you have is lung cancer, it's not gonna kill you right now. You see the difference? Mm -hmm. So you have time to think and choose a new perspective and i choose peace instead of this and this has no power over me and what does god have to say about it you've got time you're in a car crash you're bleeding your arms over there somewhere okay you need my help right now and then in the healing process you can say i'm being guided now to perfect health and perfect healing i'm going to heal by divine love that's what i did I'm going to let God take care of it. And there you go. So invite God in. It's just the acuity of the situation. Right. Thank you. I totally understand. I guess also my point would be that what if I don't know? 
and I'm in a state of panic, I think I'm fine. Um, well, of course, each situation would be have its own merits. I, I guess what I'm saying is how to truly believe that, how can I enforce or enhance that belief that God is with me and I'm okay? So that is, um, John, you can help me with this story. Um, I believe Christ help my unbelief. You start off, you've got that much faith, and you need this much faith. You can't do it alone. That's when you say, okay, I need help. Father, help me, because I'm scared. I don't know what to do. I'm just, I'm overwhelmed with all of this. You are never alone. You think you're alone. That's one of the ego's tenets, but you're not. And you have to just say, okay, I'm going to take a breath now. And what does God have to say? You have to invite the divine in. Somebody's dying in front of me. And I'll say, okay, three seconds. Father, what should I do? And then I wait. So no matter what the fire is, no matter if someone's pointing a gun at you, no matter what, it's always stop, pause, let God in, listen, and let him take care of it. And the more you do this, the more you you have this tremendous peace that descends upon you. It's the most amazing feeling. And then you watch that love go out into the whole department. And now somebody's alive. So the mistake is we think we're alone. And Joel says, and the court, the court says, turn to the Holy Spirit. Joel says, turn to God within. However you do it, okay. just say, I can't do this by myself. I'm sinking and I'm surrounded by sharks. This is not good. See? Let God in and let God clear the water for you and help you. It's a mistake, but you are the divine. God is going to provide. So there you go. Thank you. Mm -hmm. we're, at the, uh, we're at the end of our time, however... Uh, Ed, you want to go ahead and uh, see what you got to say? Hello, John. Um, I have nothing, nothing too long here. I just wanted to um, thank Rod for sharing uh, about his cancer. Um, <clears throat> and I was introduced to Rod through a um, YouTube video he did uh, with Alex uh, Ferrari, I believe, um, earlier this year <clears throat> on the Next Level Soul podcast. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, Van, I've sort of emailed Rod back and forth. So I just wanted to uh, thank Rod in person for uh, just being a blessing. And uh, this is so you, you know, we've been exchanging emails back and forth, Rod. So that's this is this is me. And uh, um, and uh, just want to thank you again, uh, John. So I know we'll be be mindful of uh, uh, the time time limits and uh, be mindful of everybody's time. So that's uh, just thank thank you guys. So thank you so much. Thank you. Well, thank you all for being here, and thank you, Rod, especially for, I always appreciate Rod's calm, ser serenity, easy voice, easy approach. It just, uh, it, it's another way of working itself into your soul, and you think, yeah, he's right, you know, that, <laughs> that's the way to do it. Mm -hmm. um, and having known him for 10, 12 years, I know that he knows <laughs> So thank you very, very much, Rod. You're welcome. It's been a pleasure to, to be able to speak and help people and understand. So it's great. Uh, so we always close with uh, reading the Lord's Prayer from A Course in Miracles. And uh, of course, I think one more time, our birthday girl, uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, Lynn turned 70. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> we're gonna, let me get it on screen. The Lord's Prayer from the Course in Miracles. Forgive us our illusions, Father, and help us to accept our true relationship with you, in which there are no illusions and where none can ever enter. Our holiness is yours. What can there be in us that needs forgiveness when yours is perfect? The sleep of forgetfulness is only the unwillingness to remember 
your forgiveness and your love. Let us not wander into temptation, for the temptation of the Son of God is not your will. And let us receive only what you have given, and accept but this into the minds which you created and which you love. Amen, amen, amen. Mm -hmm.